Thank you. Good evening, everybody. You can all hear me clearly enough. Um, there have been some really interesting talks already today, and I'm going to recap a few things. So there's going to be some themes going through tonight. Um, I wish I had this sort of event for me when I was um, graduating from Otago many years ago. So you guys are doing the right thing, and congratulate you for coming to this event. Uh, my name is John Hale. Uh, I do work for a company called Bliss Technologies, where I'm the CTO there. Um, anybody here heard of Bliss Technologies? We were in the media a couple of weeks ago for some unfortunate incident um, with a chemical. Um, but anyway, I'll, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through um, what we do and how I got here and then a few learnings that I've got on my career path. So hopefully you can take some lessons away from today. Okay, so the company I work for, Bliss Technologies, was founded by this gentleman here called Professor John Tagg. He was a professor at uh, microbiology, retired a few years ago, but he was there for about 40 years. Um, the company is really about discovering and commercialising probiotic bacteria, so good bacteria that have a health benefit, and these can be for humans or animals or whatever. Um, and we really play in a different space for most other companies out there. We play in the oral space, so the mouth, and we're also developing one for the skin at the moment, which has become a very hot topic. So that's what we do. We take good bacteria and we sell them to people. People ultimately. The company was founded in 2000 from the micro department, as I mentioned. It's a publicly listed company like Pacific Edge, which means you can buy shares in us if you wish to. You can buy some shares and you can be my boss. Um, currently, we have 25 staff. It's mixed across a range of R&D sciences, which I'll talk about today, but production, administration, finance, and, and also marketing. And the science team that we've got within that 25, we're eight full-time employees, ranging from Professor John Tagg, who's now my employee, going from my PhD supervisor to my employee, which I quite enjoy. Um, and we have a couple of postdocs and, and, and research technicians and master's quality as well. We also have four interns. So we have some interns from overseas working with us and locally with the summer student jobs, which you've probably heard about before. And we have a PhD student in food science at the moment that I'm supervising. Two sites, one in South Dunedin now. We used to just be across the road in the um, Centre of Innovation and, and one also down by the harbour. And as a company, we're a global business, so we're selling our products in, in all those areas, Australasia just recently, Asia, um, Europe, North America. So, so for my role, I'm actually engaged with very many different markets around the world trying to sell our product and from a scientific perspective. So what do I do as CTO? I lead the scientific services team, as we call ourselves, which really is trying to drive innovation, trying to keep our company at the forefront and ahead of the competitors in developing probiotics for the oral cavity and also the skin space now. But also part of it is about risk mitigation, making sure that we don't do things wrong and making sure that people can't come in and, and take over us in, in, uh, in our strategy. So a lot of strategy, scientific strategy, is what I do these days, which um, I really, really enjoy. The scientific services team is really broken down into three divisions, as I call it. There's a research division where we look at new probiotic candidates. So when the company bought all the bacterial strains from John Tagg's career off the microbiology department 20 years ago, um, we have this big freezer that we um, just dig out every day of different bacteria and we play with it to see what it can do and if there's some value for us down the line. So we have a team working on this just playing with bacteria. So these are the jobs for the lab rats, if you like. Uh, we have a development division, which are, these are really taking the bacteria once we've fermented it and grown it and made a powder, if you like, a probiotic powder. These are the people that come in and say, how do I make it into a lozenge or can I make it into a food like a yogurt? Can I make it into a gel or anything? We're doing skin creams at the moment, obviously. So how do we take this bacteria and put it into a product that we can then sell you as a customer? And can this product actually meet all the safety requirements? Can it meet regulatory requirements? Is it going to be working well in a clinical trial? So all that sort of formats and formulations start building towards building an evidence base, showing that it works it's safe um, and moving into clinical trials so working with physicians dentists whoever dermatologists showing you that this probiotic can actually do a benefit and, and within the division, division of development, we also do a lot of technical stuff, so answering questions with the different people. And finally, we have the quality division. So these are people that look after making sure that we've got it right, we've made the product, we're testing it, it's very routine. We have SOPs, where some people love SOPs, some people hate SOPs, um, that they do these protocols to make sure that the product we uh, are selling is correct. And I know the speaker after me from Gribbles is one of the companies that we engage with for testing to make sure that we have an external authority testing our products. Some of the other things, so my background, and I'll come to that in a minute, is really in microbiology. I did biochemistry, and it's a little hard for me, so I just got microbiology, so that's the track I went. Um, but in my role now, this is some things I'm going to throw out there that you get to do, and if you've got some scientific skills, it's quite relevant. Um, I do a lot of work with legal teams, so lawyers, IP, trying to make sure we've got the patent portfolio and, and sort of making sure we're protected. That's all the risk mitigation stuff and sort of leading edge. Uh, a lot of work with regulatory authorities, so regulatory people are very dry, they just have very black and white, and that's good from a consumer's point of view that your regulatory authorities are protecting you as consumers, but we have to convince the regulatory authorities that the science we're telling them is true and accurate and actually convinces them that it's safe for their citizens to take their probiotic. So a lot of work with regulatory people. Uh, clinical trials, so we're doing... Um, 
lot of work with physicians and dentists and dermatologists to convince them to run a trial with our product. And a lot of the thing I love the most in my job is scientific, I've called it here justifications, but arguments, debates, whatever you want to call it, actually talking to people about the science and convincing them what we've done is actually of value and telling people that, you know, you should take our probiotic, and I love that a bit the most. Some other skills I have to do now is sort of leading a team as financial, running projects, running things to budget. Um, I'm answerable to the CEO and a, and a board of directors, so they like to make sure that all the um, things are running to budget and asking questions when it doesn't. Um, I do a lot of communication, so obviously outreach, things like this, but conference presentations, that sort of stuff. And also having to do management skills, because you have a team, you've got to make sure things are running efficiently and fairly. So as I said, I've got that team, so I've got about 13 staff at the moment, and it's growing. Some of the other things you can do with a scientific career such as mine, you get to interact with researchers, so I have an adjunct role with microbiology now, so I do work with people across the campus here and up, up, up in the other country and globally, people doing research, so you've got to be able to talk to professors or research technicians about your projects. Uh, as I said, lawyers, medics, dentists, etc., accountants, because they like to look at the money. Fermentation supplies, so we're a very technical product to manufacture. Um, growing bacteria is not straightforward. You have to, there's lots of little tweaks you need to do, so you need to understand and talk to people and talk the language. And as the science communication person said before, sometimes you've got to dumb down some really complex ideas. So when you're talking to an accountant and you're talking about fermentation, it's probably the biggest challenge I've ever had, but we managed to get there. Um, talk to directors and regulatory people, sales and marketing, because I do a bit of work with their distributors who are selling our products across different cultures. And so there's a, quite a nice range of things there when you're trying to talk to people in India or the United States. Or, or Europe, everybody's got a different perspective on, on science and on things, so you need to be able to interact and understand the sort of cultural nuances with that. So things I never thought I'd be doing, I'm now doing. So how did I get here? Um, I'm, sure I'm not going too far over time. I did my BSc honours with uh, mainly in microbiology, but I had a lot of biochemistry in there, but I didn't really enjoy biochemistry so much. I didn't enjoy immunology, so I dropped out of the immunology papers, that's come back to bite me, um, and, and so I have to do a lot of immunology now, so that's one thing I regret, but anyway, you can pick these things up later on. So what I learned after my BSc is I learned how much I didn't know. You know, I've done a nice degree, I've learned a lot about bacteria, a bit about viruses and yeast, and a bit about the immu immunosystem, but I realised I wanted to know more. I really enjoyed about how bacteria made people sick, and I wanted to understand why. So I entered into a PhD program because I wanted to learn more. And when I, so for those of you considering a master's or a PhD program, I, I challenge you to this. What is your why for going into the PhD program? Don't do it because your girlfriend's doing it and you want to have a, a doctor title at the end of it. You've never been upgraded for having a doctor title and I've never got any privileges for it. Okay, so it's not your reason why you're doing it. What do you want to get out of it? Is it for you to be able to travel? For me, it was to be able to do what I wanted to do. Partly that was travel, but partly because I was interested in the science. Um, in my PhD, I learned to back myself in my research. I sort of went around getting advice from people, and then when nothing worked, I just had a go, and that taught me some valuable lessons just to do what you think is right, and do that first before, before you go ask people. Um, and one of the things I'll challenge you when you're doing your research or even doing other things is just keep, tra keep a track of your tools or your skills, which is a common theme today. What are the things you've learned? What can you do? What, like a carpenter, can you, can you hammer a nail in? Good, yes, tick. What else can you do? Can you do a PCR extraction? Can you do qPCR sequencing? Just take a track of what you can do because that's what's going to make you more sellable down the line. Um, if you're doing a thesis, then obviously we talked about publications before, obviously a thesis is your, is your, your key thing, but publications is what people are looking for to, to hire you. Other things you can think about are grants and patents, they also make you attractive as a future employee and it ups your sell factor. Um, after I did my PhD here in Dunedin, I um, had the opportunity to go to Vancouver to do a postdoc. I ended up working for Canada's number one research, which I didn't realise until I got there, so it was a bit daunting. The first day I turned up in his office and I said, right, what am I doing? And Bob said, go away, come back in a week and tell me what your project is. So that was kind of freaky for me to go away from little old Dunedin to Vancouver and have to go design my own project in this really, really esteemed uh, researcher's lab. And so I did that and I came back and he's like, sweet, go ahead and do it. And it worked out very well for me. So I got lucky, but I had a good team there. So once I did the postdocs, I was on the academic track, obviously. Um, you're more auto autonomous, so you've got to survive a little more. You've got more responsibility, start getting more students. Uh, but you get more opportunity, more engagements, more opportunities to attend conferences and things like that, and a chance to prove yourself. And I think I really enjoyed my first postdoc greatly, partly because Vancouver's a great city to live in, and I consider those as my fun years. I um, was then planning to go to the United Kingdom because I wanted to head back, that's where my family's originally from, back that way, and with the global financial crisis happening, there was no real jobs at 
attracted me. Um, so I met an Australian guy from Melbourne, a pharmacist, who offered me a job back at the pharmacy school at Monash, um, looking at some how bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, and I found that was quite an interesting opportunity. So I went to work in a pharmacy school, which was a, it was a different step for me. It was putting myself in the deep end a little bit, and they do things very differently in pharmacy schools, I found. Um, and I did enjoy my time there, but I kept that one rather short because I got off, offered a position back here at Bliss Technologies, which was founded out of the lab that I was doing my PhD in. They offered me a role here. So I switched from academia into a commercial role, where, as you've seen before, I've sort of started building up everything from commercial focus on science, but I still luckily have a foot in the door in academia, so I still get to publish if I find time. And don't worry, Ellie, I've still got millions of papers that should be published, and I get nagged about them all the time. So what lessons have I learned along the way? Um, first of all, follow your interests. Don't do what you don't enjoy. I call it the get out of your bed test. Can you get out of bed in the morning for your job? If you can, then it's probably a job you enjoy. If you can't, probably time to change jobs, right? It's pretty obvious, but don't do a job you don't enjoy. Capture what you do, so learn your skills, your tools, what have you been doing, and we've heard about before if you work in, you know, uh, it'll come from a farmer's family, you've got to get up and milk the cows, and skill, you know, these are the things that you can, as an employer, you look forward to that can help capture you and make you sellable, okay? Capture every time you do something, it's another line on your CV, potentially. Just remember, some people like routine, some people don't. Both are valuable skills. From our company's point of view, we have quality roles, which are very routine. That's fine. That suits some people. Other people like the dynamic role of the research and things going wrong and it doesn't upset them. That can be a good job for somebody who wants to go down a research path. PhD, masters, bachelors, all are valuable. Don't let somebody think they're better because I've got a PhD. They're not. Some of the smartest people I know are research technicians with a bachelor's. So don't let somebody tell you the PhD they're better than you because they're not. Again, what's your why? Why do you want to do it? And why do you want to go to what level you want to go to? Here's one I like. Easy is boring. If your job was easy, it would be boring. Challenge yourself. Push yourself. That's what's keep life um, creative and interesting. Network. Come to things like this. Meet people. Come and talk to me afterwards or any of the people here. I've never applied for a job. I've only ever met people through events like this or conferences, etc. It's amazing how you can do that. And as somebody said, 20% of the jobs are advertised, right? Or whatever it was. Setbacks happen. My second postdoc didn't go the way I wanted it to go. I was not too happy about that, but it's just what it is. Setbacks happen, but you can learn from them. Take the negative and turn it into a positive, and you can make sure it doesn't happen again. Back yourself, but be diplomatic. Um, you know you know what you're doing, but if you're going to say something that you don't agree with somebody, make sure you do it in the, the right approach. And never stop learning. Science doesn't stop. It's always changing. We're into crazy technology with microbiome, ionic sequence, etc. now. It doesn't stop. You have to keep up. That's why I like science. And from somebody who's recently just advertised to employ somebody and who's just sifted through 65 CVs, um, here are some lessons that I've learned. Okay? Very few people are shoulder tapped for a job. Okay? That's rare. Make sure you get out there. And you guys, I don't need to tell you that because you're here already. Some thoughts, small companies are generally more versatile and you get more exposure to different things in the roles. So Bliss is a, typically a small company. Larger companies usually have specialist roles. So if you want to be a lab technician who does nothing but testing, a big company will make sure you do that really, really well. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't know what you want to do, a smaller company will give you some opportunities. Okay, bigger companies generally have more security. Um, make sure you're interested in the role and are you going into that role as it's a career path or a stepping stone to something else? You've got to make that decision. On your CV, tell me your skills. It, tells, it seems obvious, but it's amazing when you read CVs, people are not aligning the skills to the advertised job. Okay, It sounds pretty no-brainer, but believe it. Um, employees can look to buy in the skill set, or they can build it. So they can either develop it, or we can hire so we can do stuff. Tailor your CV to the role, but don't lie, because you'll get found out. Be succinct. I got a CV with 28 pages. That one didn't get very far in the process, shall we say. Two pages is as much as you need. And then follow up and engage with the people. If the advertiser's got a name, you can always, there's always a phone number or an email. You can always just follow up and say, hey, I sent a CV and did you get it? I'm just checking. Just, just that simple step mate, goes a long way. For your interview, be prepared. We've heard about this already. Look up the website of the company. See what they do. Who are their competitors? What's the opportunity? It really seems obvious, but you'd be amazed how many people don't do that. Don't be precious about the role. Not everybody gets a job exactly what they want. There are going to be elements of the job that you probably don't like, but it's good to understand them and, and just don't be precious about it. Just get on and do them. Ask questions in the interview. It shows that you've got some thought behind the process and you've got interest. That's always well, well received from the employer's side. And then after the interview, follow up a few days later saying thank you very much for the interview. Keeps your name in the mix, okay? 
those are just some skills. I'm happy to talk with anybody afterwards. We also have some internships coming up, so feel free to come and ask me later on. It doesn't matter if you're biochemistry, microbiology, or genetics, so they're always skills for reporting. Thank you. <laughs>